So I uploaded my video yesterday about the how we make money making YouTube videos. So let's talk about how we make YouTube videos. And specifically, of course, questions that came up was the gear I use. And this is one of those things that I'm gonna recommend. There's a lot of channels. I think one of them is actually called Tube Noob. Uh, it's kind of cool because they have a whole list of different things you can get uh, to help start your YouTube channel on a budget. Um, this is not your base budget stuff. This is what I use and kind of why I use it. And there's a lot of different setups and it's not like there's one better than the other. It kind of comes down to what you're comfortable with. Now, I have a background in photography. I have a background as a wedding photographer. Not everybody knows that about me, uh, but it's really not a secret if you do know anything about me. Uh, I've long loved photography and I was a Canon shooter when I was doing the wedding photography and I probably shot over 500 weddings. Canon just became my go-to. I had a ton of photography equipment, which I slowly sold and traded in to get video equipment because I you know, made this run at YouTube here. And the first thing I'm gonna talk about, this is my old spare camera from doing wedding photography. It was like the backup one, but it became an easy shooter here for uh, doing video. So this is a Canon 70D and I still use it and all the B-roll in this video will be from my Canon 70D. It is still a great camera. It still holds up really well. It does have a couple issues and actually uh, I had two of them and the other one died which led to the next camera we're gonna talk about. I have this with Magic Lantern which allows you to really unlock features that Canon didn't really ship it with. Uh, and I believe, and this is a guess, that all the extra usage and the really long record times I was doing when we were doing some of the vlogs and things like that, that actually had to be split up because we were running so long. That's where you run into a challenge with this Canon 70D and a lot of other SLR cameras that don't do long record times. And the camera burned up. So now I have one that is just my 70D of spare parts and this one is still in use but it's just used for B-roll and it works really well for that. Now, because I'm using Canon, we're gonna talk about the next camera. The one I chose was the Canon C100 Mark II. Now, it's not the popular choice of YouTubers, but it is a popular choice for people who do documentaries and things like that. So it's, it, Canon's camera's been around a while, so it's no, it's not some fancy new 4K camera. Canon sells this camera and it's, I think still goes for a little under uh, $4,000, maybe $3,500. I haven't looked at the price on it in a while. Um, I've had it for about a year. I love that camera. One of the reasons why is I don't want to spend a lot of time in post-production. And the C100 has top-notch audio inputs, so I really don't have to do any post-processing and audio. Uh, Video-wise, Canon is a weird camera with the way they did this, and this is really cool. It has a 4K sensor that downsamples to 1080 with dual pixel autofocus and really crispy sharp pictures. Uh, the weird part is I'm shooting this on a 50 millimeter f1.8 lens, sometimes referred to as a nifty 50. Great lens, you can pick it up for less than $100 like I did, and it's really weird to get this kind of quality out of a you know, sub $100 lens with a $3,000 plus camera, but the results are great. Uh, and to shoot with this shallow depth of field with all the lights around me and balancing the light, I have it with two ND stops. And if you're not familiar with neutral density filters, something you don't get in SLR cameras, you have to put them on the lens. It actually has a whole series of ND filters to stop down the light to keep these really shallow depth of field focus uh, right out of here. And Canon's color science as it's referred to, so you have color profiles like C-Log for uh, editing and so you can do all your post-production. Once again, I don't wanna do post-production, so I use a color profile uh, loaded in there. So the video comes out of the camera, no post-production and color has to be applied. Um, I mean, obviously you could always spruce it up a little bit, but it doesn't make a big difference on my videos. So I'm actually gonna upload this directly out of the camera with no adjustment, just to give you guys an idea. Uh, that's part of the reason, like I said, for the Canon. It's an expensive camera. It's probably not the most ideal, but in terms of being a studio camera, it does have clean HDMI out. And that clean HDMI out really is nice when you're doing things like a live stream. It's a workhorse of a camera, so it's, like I said, maybe it not that I'm going to say every YouTuber should get this, but it is not a bad one. Uh, plus, it has XLR mic inputs. So I'm not currently using XLR mic. I will get to the mic in a second. Um, but it's nice that it has that support. If you have other microphone, other audio inputs, um, it just makes it really nice. Speaking of streaming, Live Gamer Portable 2. I'll give a shout out to the Linux Gamer on this. This is how we do our live streams. There's actually a TV on the wall over there uh, where I have this being viewed 
or cam views. So that's how we do our live streams using OBS. Um, and this plugged in is just great. So HDMI in on this uh, works in Linux, works in Windows. Like I said, Linux gamer, I seen him review it and I was like, oh cool, this works in Linux. I'm a Linux guy. Uh, so that's how we do our live streams and capture for that. It, it's actually really nice because of being an HDMI capture. Um, my friend Jay has actually used my studio a few times to do distro reviews with it where he can directly capture instead of doing a screen capture so he can capture things like loading and stuff like that. Uh, great little device and I'll leave a link to all these things below but yeah that's we've been using that for our live streams. Next we're going to talk about lighting. Now these are Aperture AL528S Amarin lights and they have the uh, Aperture Easy Softbox on them. They're simple, they're easy. Uh, they do support running on battery or being plugged into the wall. They're easy to quickly dial in and get my lighting set. And the soft boxes make them just really, pro I think they look professional and they work because they're nice soft light. Because if you don't have them with the soft boxes, the light's just really harsh and it uh, makes me wince when I try to look at the camera without them. So it's kind of like a good kit to put those together. And then my backlight is provided by an Aperture Armor and AL F7 3200 to 9500K, which means it's got adjustable color. So the other ones are fixed color, but this is an adjustable color, so you can make it really warm or really cool light. Um, it's nice. The one thing I'll note about it, as much as I do like it, and it's running right now off of USB-C, but you can put a battery on it. And if you put the battery, a Sony NP series battery, uh, it will run off the battery, but it won't charge the battery. Uh, so that's kind of weird. Versus the other lights will run on the battery and when you plug them in, they charge the battery at the same time. So they're always charging and whenever I have to do a product shot where I don't uh, have a cord easily reaching or have to worry about plugging in a wall, I can just grab the lights and move them over with the Sony batteries plugged in and it'll run off the Sony batteries. I think I get almost an hour or two of runtime on there. So that's how I move the studio lights in other areas and it works really well. Microphone, just out of view here. Actually, I'm gonna drag it down in view a little bit. And then we'll switch to B-roll. <laughs> um, the Asden microphone has been a great choice. It sounds good, in my opinion. I uh, watched a few reviews on it. I don't think the downside is, of course, it takes batteries, but that's not too big of a deal. I have rechargeable batteries that I just pop in at the beginning of each session. Uh, it's got a couple different boost options, and with the processor in the C100, it just... I never have to really make any adjustments. I have the C100 on auto. I have this uh, boosted, and it just sounds great. The other cool thing, it's a two-in-one microphone. So you've got the shotgun mic, which is what we're on now, and it's got a stereo option. And I've used that when we have a few of us when we're uh, around the table. I just switch over to stereo if I got to pick up more than one person. So the pickup pattern, you know, narrowed down for shotgun, like when it's just me talking, but you can just add another pickup pattern uh, for stereo if you want to do it kind of like in a group setting and have everyone talking around it and hanging above them. Now off to the side here is the Feel World T7 7 inch IPS display field monitor. Now, this was a bit of confusion to me until I got into this. Uh, this field world is really nice. I actually like it. it. For as inexpensive as it is, it's less than $200 on Amazon. Uh, it runs off, one again, one of these Sony batteries. And the difference between a field monitor and a just plug in an HDMI monitor like Tom was doing, uh, turns out one, color accuracy. So the TV does not show me, uh, it shows me me really big. It does not show me uh, the details I need as a YouTuber to make sure my video is being produced properly. What I mean by that is this shows me like what they refer to as focus peaking, which is also supported on the C100 camera, um, but it's really quick to view that. Now, the confusing part is it's called 4K. Now, it does not have a 4K display, but that means it will take a 4K input, even though my camera is only 1080, but if I upgrade to a 4K camera, it will downsample that and still display everything here. Apparently, some of them won't downsample because cameras will put out at a fixed rate, and then you have to have something that deals with it. But this field monitor is nice. It has uh, audio monitoring on it. Stupid problem is it doesn't have a mute button that I can find for the audio. So I took a broken headphone jack and popped it in the headphone side because it outputs sound all the time and I don't want it to do that. Uh, so it's actually, you can't even see it because it's flush with it. It's That's actually a broken headphone jack in there. So, uh, but it's got two HDMI inputs. If I had um, two camera feeds, I can feed it with both cameras. I can switch between them. I think so. I've never tried that. I think that's why there's two HDMI feeds. 
Anyways, I've never tested it. I only ever feed it with one camera. Uh, so I'm, there's plenty of reviews on this that are better than mine. I'm just showing you what I'm using for the uh, camera stuff. But it does work really well. Um, the other being that it's a less expensive field monitor is if you want it off, it does have an off button, but it still seems to drain the battery less than when it's on, but it does drain it. So uh, whenever I'm done with that is pop the battery off. And that's been my solution based. It's a good thing. I'm glad reviewers told me that because uh, if not, I'd, be, I'd go turn it on later and wonder why the battery's dead. Now I'll talk real quick about batteries. Um, I have chose the K-A-S-T-A-R, Castor. I don't know how to pronounce things sometimes. And uh, this battery kit, Amazon, inexpensive. Uh, it charges up these and has a nice display. I used to have a cheaper one that didn't have display. And it's kind of annoying. You don't really know where it's charging. It blinks a pattern like, hey, if it blinks this fast, it's this charge and that charge. This has nice and 10% increments of how charged the batteries are. And it does two at a time. Uh, so I always have two batteries on it. And that way my field monitor uh, which has the MPN, or if I have that other light that uh, requires it too. Easy to charge both of them and just have two batteries at the ready all the time. It was inexpensive, but uh, definitely worth it. It was It's a great charger. Now let's talk about this, because this is kind of neat. I don't use it all the time. I keep planning to use it more. This is for doing product shots. It's uh, sometimes called a dolly or a slider. It's actually a combo dolly slider. So one, it can slide the camera back and forth like this, for a product shot or, and this is where it gets kind of cool, uh, you adjust these up and down so it locks in place or doesn't lock in place uh, the wheels because obviously you don't always want it to move, but when you want it to move, so actually when you get the wheel to the edge here, I can send it all the way around me and back. And of course if the product was there, well, I'm gonna hit it. But you kind of get the idea if you get, if you get the placement, you can do these kind of cool spin around this thing is actually so stupidly fun to play with. It's got really nice wheels with bearings in it. And then you spin these little rubber stoppers and uh, they just bring the wheels up off a little bit. And then it's actually pretty stable. So we can then do it as a slide or spin it around like this because you wanna bring it closer to your product for that kind of zoomed in effect. If I do more product videos, I bought it for that. It was on sale on Amazon uh, and I couldn't resist. I do really like doing some of the higher end photography work, but it comes down to processing and editing. And I'm like, okay, let's just get this review done. Uh, but I plan to do some more stuff on here. I, I don't want to get overly processed because I care more about the content than uh, the glam of it. Uh, but these tools will make it handy. Now I will address real quick how we mount everything. And how we mount everything is actually with these Joby mounts. Now, I believe the Joby is compatible with what they call Arca Swiss mount. Uh, it seems to fit in the Joby. I have at least one Arca Swiss that I've tried with them. Um, if you want to look that up, you'll see what they are. There's different mount plates. But the uh, nice thing about the Joby is I'm very, very confident with it. So <laughs> I can put this Joby in here oh, and I just tighten that and I'm not worried about it or this. And when you have expensive equipment, and I do use these mounts for everything, uh, they're kind of an investment, but once you've got them, it's so nice because everything is so easy to articulate, put exactly where you want, and you can feel confident when it's on there, it's not coming off. It just has a really nice feel, great build quality. And uh, even with a heavier DSLR like this, if I put the camera at an angle and dial it in, it doesn't creep on you because there's nothing more aggravating. You get a product shot set up, you hit record, and then you're doing it and you're watching the camera slowly fall over. Now, I also do have this, uh, which is the Gorillapod, made probably famous by Casey Neistat for a lot of his work. This is a great uh, tool if you got to wrap it around something uh, for a shot or you're, when I'm doing some of the on-site videos, which I need to do more of, uh, but you can just wrap this around something and mount it. And uh, I did one of them where I was standing on a man lift. We literally just wrap this around the edge of the man lift. It's a solid mount and solid here. And when you're 20 foot up on a man lift, you really don't want to drop your uh, camera, your lenses and things like that. Cause it'll just, it'll go horribly wrong. So that's all the mounts. Now quickly on the lenses, I only have a couple of them. I used to have a lot more when I was in photography, but the ones I use is the Nifty 50, like you're uh, watching right here from this part. This is the Sigma 10 to 20 millimeter. And uh, this is, you know, for those really wide angle shots. And then the last lens I have is the 1835 STM Canon lens. And one of the cool features of C100 is it has facial detection, but the facial detection only works with a certain limited number of lenses. Uh, one of them is that 1835. So it's not like a professional cinema lens, but it gets a job done and it does support facial detection. Uh, it doesn't have that super shallow depth of field like this 50 millimeter that's on there now, but it's great for, and I've shot a lot of my other videos on there. 
Now, the last thing about the mounts is how does it all, you know, what's on this mic stand? What's on this? Well, let's talk about that. This is usually out of frame and this is a ProCam LS, I'm sorry, ProMaster LS6 uh, boom stand. And I got it down lower than usual. Uh, it's usually completely out of frame here. Once again, Joby mounts on there. But what I'm gonna do is show you how we do these overhead shots, what I'm doing. Me. Uh, I'm usually standing up to do this, but I can do it like this. Just gotta get the camera in place and tighten this up a little bit. And I'm just centering it because I'm particular like that. So now that that's centered and we do that, and then we take the camera. I was gonna make sure all this is nice and tight, nice and tight. Tighten this up and there's a little lever on it. And that's how we get these shots. Uh, what's loose? This one. It's hard to reach them because I'm, oh, they're just out of frame. And there we go. Once you tighten them up, they're not that hard to tighten. Uh, I'm just reaching. And then this is how I get the overhead shots. So we line the camera up here. It's usually just, like I said, above. So when you're seeing me do a product, one camera shooting down, seeing the product, and then this one. Uh, and I, the audio is not as good on the 70D, so I always refer to that as my narrative track that comes off the uh, C100 because the audio is gonna be so much better and I just cut back and forth between the cameras. But that's really it for all the gear I use. Uh, the only other one that's not featured here is I left that at home is I do have a um, GoPro Hero. Uh, I think it's the Black 5 or Black 6. I don't remember which one it is. Uh, I, I use that for my time lapses. It works really well for that. And it's got the same thing. I got these same uh, mounts on it. And I usually just stick the GoPro on here uh, in a cage and hit time lapse. That's how we get some of those time lapse videos you've seen of some of the uh, wiring installs we do and things like that. But it's all been, yeah, it's all worked really well for me in terms of that. And I don't use it as often, but if you wanted, I still have my Phantom 4 drone. I need to use it more. It's always on my to-do list uh, whenever we do a project, but then I get sidetracked because I don't go on site as much because uh, I just don't always have the time to do it, to go fly or through a building or something like that. I'm hoping we can do it. We have a client that I want to showcase some of the uh, stuff and I'm hoping to get permission to do a drone there. Plus I want to do a drone. We got to do a wrap up on another video uh, for the bowling alley and I want to use a drone for that, but I don't use it as often as I'd like. Uh, lastly, and I can leave a link to this, I'm still using Caden Live for all my editing. I run Linux, I run Pop! OS, that's December 2018, but I'm still running uh, as my operating system, and I still use Caden Live for all my editing. Someone's going to say, have you tried DaVinci? I've looked at it, it's neat. Uh, maybe because I will uh, need more titling. That's the one big hang up I have when I'm doing this is the titling is just awful in Caden Live. I've donated money to the project. I've watched them really evolve it. They've become a very stable product. It doesn't crash as often. It's really good at features. It's how I've got over 600 videos on my channel edited with it. Only a few videos were edited with uh, OpenShot, which is when I really, really first started and before I moved to Caden Live. But when it comes to adding titles, yeah, they they really need a good titling system. Uh, I usually have to do the titles with some other random thing and import them and overlay them, and it's tedious, and that is getting to me a little bit. Uh, I am considering DaVinci at some point. I've really been trying to stick with it all open source, but sometimes if it just isn't there, it just isn't there. And if I can't get uh, some of the titles put the way I want, I may have to switch to something like that to really add and enhance the titling features. Uh, because it just looks nice when I can put all, I'd like to be able to easily, because it's so much work in post-production to put just the specs next to me or whatever I'm talking about. Um, so that is something I'm considering for those wondering. No, I don't have any interest in using the Adobe Suite or learning it. I was a full-blown and long-time Adobe user when I was a wedding photographer, hands down. Uh, the Adobe Lightroom and Adobe Photoshop is perfect for photography. And I know the Adobe Editing Suite for video is really good, but i am just been determined for no other reason than feather in my hat to keep using open source for this. Uh, kind of a prove you can type thing, and uh, I don't know. I, I can't really answer other than torturing myself as to why. So I'll leave links to all this gear where you can buy it. Pretty much all of it's available on Amazon. I have some affiliate links. So I'd appreciate the uh, help out for the channel if you click those to buy this. Um, if you have any questions, comments, or care to have me elaborate or review more on any one particular thing, uh, let me know. I don't do a ton of gear video because I'm not... Um, well, I'm not a camera gear expert. I did th talk about talking about the C100 a little bit more, but yeah, for the most part, let me know if there's some interest, like, hey, I really want to know more about this. If not, I can really recommend uh, Tube Noob and uh, DS, I think DSLR Video Shooter. They have just 
I've learned tons from both of those channels. And uh, probably, I, if I can remember the names of some of the other channels that were just uh, immense resources, besides uh, like Casey Neistat, who, no, I don't shoot in his style, nor do I plan to, but his uh, Casey Neistat's guilt Guide to Filmmaking, to me, is one of those things that can really help you get at least an understanding, because you have to create your narrative and things like that. And that makes me think of how do I tell the story, which I probably babbled a little bit here, but it is um, a guide to help how you maybe should assemble uh, what you want to do for YouTube. And, you know, it all depends on what your purpose is. Mine more, mostly is, you know, sharing knowledge about everything, open source firewalls, blah, blah, blah. But I wanted to share what I'm using for equipment and how I built my studio for those of you wondering. One last thing I wanted to cover real quick is just the layout of the studio. So I'm standing like in our, what we call our kitchen. And if you're wondering what this is, this is for a future video we're going to be doing soon. Anyways, um, so this is the layout of the studio with all the foam on the walls. Uh, there's more foam than you need if you're soundproofing, but it does make a big difference. So now I'm in the soundproof area. I don't know if you notice the echoes start going away. Um, the camera sits here and we run everything, which is some magnets and wires. We have HDMI wall jack. We keep all the wires above our head and just using little magnets that or from Harbor Freight with hooks because when you walk in, please note the lack of wires on the floor. I hate wires on the floor. Uh, it doesn't look good. It's a trip hazard and people walk through here all the time. And I can't have people coming in the studio, including myself, and knocking things over because you yank something and the, as the equipment being expensive, pulling a camera over, things like that. Uh, so that's kind of just the general layout of the studio. And then uh, when we're all done with this big table, uh, we clear it all off. We just put the lights off to the side, but all the little photography gear actually ends up all in here. It's just a metal uh, cobalt cabinet from Lowe's. And then we lock everything in here. And it's also where we keep all the charging equipment. So that way it's all nice. You know, the drone batteries are here, the Canon battery chargers. Um, it's over here still on the table from the demo, but the, the Sony NP battery charger, all that just goes in there, so it's all consolidated in one place. Uh, but that's it. Thanks, and I'll leave links to everything below. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, go ahead and click the thumbs up. Leave us some feedback below to let us know any details, what you like and didn't like as well, because we love hearing the feedback, or if you just want to say thanks, leave a comment. If you want to be notified of new videos as they come out, go ahead and hit the subscribe and the bell icon. That lets YouTube know that you're interested in notifications. Hopefully they send them, <laughs> as we've learned with YouTube. Anyways, if you want to contract us for consulting services, you go ahead and hit lawrencesystems.com and you can reach out to us for all the projects that we can do and help you. We work with a lot of uh, small businesses, IT companies, even some large companies, and you can farm different work out to us or just hire us as a consultant to help design your network. Also, if you want to help the channel in other ways, we have a Patreon. We have affiliate links. You'll find them in the description. You'll also find recommendations to other affiliate links and things you can sign up for on lawrencesystems.com. Once again, thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.